we're going to start chapter 30, which is uh, discussing induction and inductance. All right, so we're going to first look at two experiments. In the first experiment, um, we're going to take a magnet and run it through a coil of wire um, that is connected to a, an ammeter. All right, so the magnet's motion is going to create a current in the loop. So the current uh, appears only if there is relative motion between the loop and the magnet. One must move relative to the other. All right, so the current disappears when the relative motion between them ceases. Now, the faster the motion, uh, the faster motion produces a greater current. And if the magnet's north pole toward the uh, loop causes, say, a clockwise current, then moving the north pole away causes a counterclockwise current. All right, and then vice versa, moving the south pole toward or away from the loop uh, also causes currents, but in the reverse directions. All right, so the current um, thus produced in the loop is called induced current. All right, so we're basically creating an EMF source um, by running this magnet through a coil of wire. All right, now the second experiment is a little bit different. So for this experiment, uh, we use the apparatus shown here. So it's going to be one circuit with a switch, an EMF source, and a resistor, and then a coil of wire. And then the other circuit is similar to the first one, where it's connected to an ammeter. All right, so with the two conducting loops close to each other, but not touching, if we close the switch S to turn on a current in the right-hand loop, the meter suddenly and briefly registers a current, an induced current in the left-hand loop. So if we then open the switch, uh, another sudden and brief induced current appears in the left-hand loop, but in the opposite direction. So we get an induced current, and thus an induced EMF, only when the current in the right-hand loop is changing, either turning on or turning off, and not when it's constant, even if it is large. Okay, so this magnetic field being given off by the, one, by the loop that's connected to the EMF source is going to uh, induce a current in the other circuit only if the current is changing. All right, and we're going to get into flux here. We actually need a change in flux to create this EMF source. All right, so if the magnetic field is constant, you're not going to have this induced EMF. But if you have the the um, the magnetic field or the or the current in the first one changing, then you're going to get this induced EMF in the other one. All right, so we'll look at this a little bit closer. All right, so let's first look at uh, Faraday's law of induction. And EMF is induced in the loop at the left of these, both of both of the figures in the first two experiments, when the number of magnetic field lines that passes through the loop is changing. All right, so the, again, the flux is going to be changing. The, magnet, uh, excuse me, the magnitude of the EMF induced in a conducting loop is equal to the rate at which the magnetic flux through the loop changes with time. All right, so we would expect our, when our flux changes with time, that's going to give us this induced EMF. And that actually gets us to Faraday's law which we'll get to in a second. All right, so suppose a loop encircling an area A is placed in a magnetic field. All right, so something like this. We have a loop, and it's placed in this magnetic field. And of course, inside of this loop, you have some area A. The magnetic flux through this loop is going to be given by, all right, Of course, this is the flux, the magnetic flux, so we have that subscript to B there, is equal to the integral of B dot dA, right? The magnetic field times the area. All right, so this is going to be our magnetic flux through an area A. Now, if the loop lies in a plane, and the magnetic field is going to be perpendicular to that plane of the loop, uh, then the magnetic field is constant. All right, so if this, if you had a 90 degrees here between the uh, area, which is going to be flat on, the, on a plane, and then the magnetic field coming into it, it would be perpendicular with the plane. Um, however, when we show, let's say, let's redraw it here, we know the area vector itself is, is perpendicular like this. It's coming away from the plane. So if that's the area vector, and this is our magnetic field vector, 
right, the angle is going to be 180. So when we do the stop product, we have the cosine of 180. Okay, so because of that, it's, we, it's either going to be the cosine of 0 or the cosine of 180, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, but if it's perpendicular, then we know that we can just pull the magnetic field, right? As long as the magnetic, the, excuse me, pull the magnetic field out of the integral, as long as the magnetic field is um, uniform. All right, so if the magnetic field is uniform, then our flux is simply going to be, oops, I can write that down here. Our flux, magnetic flux, is going to be just BA. Right, because you would just end up with the integral of dA, and that would just be the area. All right, so this is when B is uniform, and B is going to be perpendicular to A. Okay, so the SI unit for magnetic flux is going to be the Tesla meter squared, right? You have uh, the magnetic field times an area, so it's just going to be Tesla meter squared, which we're going to call a Weber. Right, and we're going to abbreviate that WB. So one Weber is one Tesla times meters squared. All right, so let's go back up to this thought we had up here. So the magnitude of the EMF induced in a conducting loop is equal to the rate at which the magnetic flux uh, through that loop changes with time. All right, so we can write that into an equation, and that's going to be Faraday's law. So our EMF is equal to our change in flux divided by our change in time. Okay, and that's Faraday's law. Okay, so moving on. Um, so if we change the magnetic flux through a, oops, and I forgot a negative sign. Let me put that negative sign back in there. All right, there's going to be a negative, and we'll get to why that is in a second. So if we change the magnetic flux through a coil of n turns, an induced EMF appears in every turn. And the total EMF induced in the coil is just going to be the sum of these individual uh, induced EMFs. So if the coil is tightly wound, which means it's closely packed, you have a coil like this, where the wires are really closely packed, and you have, let's say, a magnetic field going through the center of it. Um, so the same magnetic flux uh, is going to pass through each of these coils, then the total EMF induced in the coil is just going to be n times um, the, uh, the derivative of the flux. All right, so this is going to be for a coil of n turns. All right, so here's some, um, some general means by which we can change the magnetic flux through a coil. Well, we can change the magnitude B of the magnetic field within the coil. Right, so if you change the amount of magnetic field going through, um, you would change the flux. We could change either the total area of the coil or the portion of that area that lies um, within the magnetic field. For example, by expanding the coil or sliding into or out of a field. So for instance, um, if we had a field coming out of the page like this, and let's say this was our coil looking at looking down through the center of the coil, we could maybe we slide this into the field, so maybe only half of it is actually in the field and half of it is out of the field. Um, and we could change the angle between the direction of the magnetic field B and the plane of the coil. So for example, by rotating the coil so that the B is first perpendicular to the plane um, of the coil and then is along the plane. All right, so if we just kind of tilted the direction of the field or we tilted the direction of the coil so that the magnetic field wasn't directly hitting it um, perpendicularly. All right, so let's go ahead and do an example. Um, all right, so a long solenoid shown uh, in cross-section, right? So here's our solenoid over here. This is the blue part that's going around this inner one. Uh, it has 220 turns per centimeter and carries a current of 1.5 amps. Its diameter is 3.2 centimeters. At its center, we place a 130 turn closely packed coil C of diameter uh, 2.1 centimeters. All right, so inside of our solenoid, we have a coil, All right, shown the cross section as well. So the current in the solenoid is reduced to zero at a steady rate in 25 milliseconds. 
So what is the magnitude of the EMF that is induced in the coil, C, while the current in the solenoid is changing? All right, so basically what you have, you have current running through the solenoid, and it's decreasing. It takes 25 milliseconds to decrease down to zero. So we're trying to see what this change in magnetic field, what kind of flux it's producing on the inner coil. All right, so let's look at a few ideas. All right, so because it's located in the interior of the solenoid, coil C lies within the magnetic field produced by the current I in the solenoid. Thus, there is a magnetic flux through C. All right, now, because the current I decreases, the flux also decreases, right? So the flux is going to be changing, which means we'll have some EMF. Now, as the flux decreases, the EMF is going to be induced in the coil. Let's jump over here to four. The flux through each turn of coil C depends on the area A and orientation of that turn in the solenoid's magnetic field. Um, so because B is uniform and directed perpendicularly to, to area A, the flux is just going to be simply given by this, so we don't have to worry about the integral equation. All right, now the magnetic field B of the, uh, excuse me, the magnitude of uh, B of the magnetic field in the interior of a solenoid depends on the solenoid's current and its number of turns per unit length according to this equation. So this is the magnetic field due to a solenoid. We, scored a, we sort of skimmed past it in a previous chapter, so we're just going to take the result of that um, for this application. All right, so let's look at the calculations then. All right, so because coil C consists of more than one turn, we apply Faraday's law in the form of, of as shown, because there's multiple turns, right? This is what we saw in the last slide, where the number of turns N is 130, and uh, d omega dt is the rate at which the flux changes. Okay, so because the current in the solenoid decreases at a steady rate, uh, the flux also decreases at a steady rate, and so we can write um, our derivative equation simply as the change in flux over the change in time. Then we evaluate um, d or the, the change in omega or the change in flux. And we need the final and initial flux values. The final flux is zero because the final current in the solenoid is zero. All right, and then to find initial flux, we note that the area is simply going to be one-fourth pi d squared, right, which is going to be equal to that, right, and the number of turns is 220 turns per centimeter. Okay, so this was a lot. Let's maybe work through some of this. Okay, um, so let's first look at the flux that is through the solenoid itself, because right? that's what we really want to figure out. So the flux, the initial flux, and we know it goes to zero, so the final flux is going to be zero. The initial flux is simply going to be the magnetic field times A, which is equal to our magnetic field due to a solenoid, which is mu naught I times N, where N is going to be um, the turns per centimeter, right, up here. And we multiply that by an area. All right, so now at this point we can go ahead and solve for what this value is going to be. So our flux is going to be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters over amps. All right, that's our mu naught. Oops. We go. Oops. All right, times our current, which is 1.5 amps, times our density. We want to convert this to meters, right? So we have 220 turns per centimeter. We want to um, convert that to turns per meter. So that's just going to be 22,000 turns a meter. And this is multiplied by the area, right, which we found over here. It's just going to be one-fourth pi d squared, right? This is just the area of, of a circle. Okay, so this is going to be 3.464 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. Squeeze it in there. And we see that our flux, our initial flux, is going to be equal to 1.44 times 10 to the negative 5th 
Weber's. Okay, so this was for our solenoid. Um, so now we want to find what the change in flux is. All right, so this is going to be our change in flux, T, is equal to, again, our delta omega V divided by our change in time, which is going to be our final flux minus our initial flux, oops, initial, divided by our change in time. So this is just going to be negative 1.44 times 10 to the negative 5 Weber's divided by 25 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds, right? And the result, so our change in flux, is going to be negative 5.76 times 10 to the negative 4 Weber's a second, and Weber's divided by seconds is actually volts. So this is actually in volts. Okay, so the last thing we want to do is figure out, now, now that we found what our change in flux is, we want to figure out what the induced EMF is on this inner, inner coil of wire. All right, so our induced EMF is simply going to be N times d i b divided by dt. And we're just ignoring the negative sign at this point. So that's going to be 130 turns times our, in, our um, change in flux, 5.76 times 10 to the negative 4 volts. All right, so our induced EMF is 7.5 times 10 to the negative 2 volts or approximately 75 millivolts. Okay, that's it for this lecture. We will pick it up next time.